Good morning, CLA. How are we feeling this morning? Feeling energized, ready to worship? Come on, we just want to welcome you to church this morning. Listen, we also want to welcome everyone that is watching online. Uh, if you watch online weekly, you may wonder, hey, why wasn't there anything at 9 a.m.? Unfortunately, technology sometimes doesn't cooperate with us, but we're back up and running for the 11 a.m. service, and so we just want to welcome everyone online. Why don't you stand up with me this morning? Listen, it is Communion Sunday, and so if you have not yet grabbed your element, you can do so at the back. We have some volunteers who have some available but I just want to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, and it says this, For great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you family of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. And this morning, bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Let's worship this morning, church. Fiction. By his blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, his life is testified All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Ears have heard or eyes have seen I believe that a day is coming He's returning to claim His bride Light the altar, keep it burning See the Lamb who rolls around
God the Father Oh, that is 
sing this out, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh my soul, bless his name. All that is within me say, Oh my soul, bless his name. Providing. 
Jesus, you reign above it all. Hello. 
found on the highest praise You sent the darkness running Out of an empty grave Now seated alone in glory Enthroned on the highest praise You sent the darkness running Out of an empty grave Now seated alone Give Jesus a shout of praise this morning. He, he reigns above it all. Come on. As we were singing that song, I was reminded about the old Sunday school song, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. Listen, he's got your issues. He's got your problems. He's got your fears, your worries, your difficulties. He has them in his hands. He reigns above it all. Scripture says for us to take heart because he has overcome the world. And so, Father, this morning, we thank you that we are a people that are overcomers. That, Father, when we face fear, worry, doubt, anxiety, Father, you reign above every single one of those things in our life. And so, Father, we just praise you right now. We just worship you. We, we are just in awe of you this morning. So, Father, this morning, as we just continue to worship you, Father, would you just continue to come? Would your power, would your Holy Spirit rest on us this morning? We love you. We honor you. We give you all the praise and all the glory in this house this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, give him a shout of praise. One more. Come on. You guys can take a seat. Feel free to take a seat. Ushers, you may come forward and take up this morning's tithes and offerings. Good morning, CLA. How are we feeling this morning? Feeling good? Awesome. Love it. A few announcements this morning. We have three ministry tables in the foyer this morning. The first ministry table is this. Rev Camp 2024 is here. It's launched. It's almost summer. Come on. Praise God. It's almost summer. And so early bird registration is on now. And so you can visit our booth out in the lobby after, after service to sign up, or you can sign up on our web, website at revcamp.ca. As well, we have a men's retreat coming up in the month of June, June 7th to 9th. And so if you're a man in this house, 
Um, this is just going to be a great weekend for you to get away with other men. And so feel free to go look out in the lobby this morning for more information on that. As well, you can also sign up for Wednesdays in the Word, just a time on Wednesdays, obviously, to come together and get into God's Word together. And there's also a booth out there for you to check out as well. Other than that, we have a Abbotsford Campus Vision Gathering this morning at 12.30 p.m., and that is happening in the East Hall, which is that way. As well, we have a dedication for Jenny Gillardi Place happening today at 12.45, and that is happening over at the complex as well. And so now I'm going to give it away to the bumper. So in the first service, we didn't have that really cool introduction. Uh, In fact, second service, this is a great second service to be in. Yes, Yes, it is, because my friends from Kelowna are here. No, that's not right, Uh, although that's true. But in the first, so first service is our largest of the six services that we'll have today. And uh, we go live online at at nine normally, and we have over a thousand people online And that was all disturbed by technology today. So second service, you are the ones being recorded today. Yes, and you should give a big hand to those who are joining online because this is for them. And I'm very, very excited that we're, that we're able to record this for those that are online. Okay, last week we began the Revealed series. Revealed means that which was once unknown, is made known. And so that's the goal, is to take the book of Revelation, what is unknown, and make it known. We talked last week about apocalyptic literature, that out of all the genre in the Bible, different literatures in the Bible, uh, apocalyptic literature is the only one that doesn't exist today in the 21st century. So because of that, it makes it a bit of a challenge for us to be able to understand the cryptic, symbolic, bold, and powerful images that are there to stir our imagination. It is not literal. The Apostle John uh, writes this apocalypse, smuggles it off of Alcatraz, then known as the island of Patmos, gets it out to the seven churches of Asia Minor. The closest thing that I can think of today uh, that would be a- apocalyptic literature would be the political cartoon. So if you ever are online, you know, or a, a newspaper, if, if you were to see, for example, the little island of Taiwan wrapped in its flag, and you were to see a ginormous dragon coming out of the sea to swallow it. Is it literally a dragon? No. It's probably what? China. Very good. So that helps you understand apocalyptic literature. It's bold. In fact, I've got a, I've got a little thing here. Uh, if you were in the United States and you saw these symbols... Uh, you saw an elephant. What might you think of? Elephant. It's not really an elephant, is it? It's a symbol for the Republican Party. If you saw a donkey, it's not really an ass, is it? Uh, don't say that. It's the Democratic Party. So I actually went online to try to figure out where these came from 100 years ago. And I, it was so confusing, I couldn't even synthesize it. But you know those are symbols, right? So they're not really Uh, a donkey. They're not really uh, an elephant. Today, we are reading Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Heaven is for real. 
Today we have a very special reader. Monica is going to come. Monica Unger is my executive assistant and my life would be terrible without her. She brings order to all things Hamry. Would you welcome her uh, as she reads Revelation chapter 4 and part of chapter 5. Revelation 4 and 5 are one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. The symbolism is amazing, but it's the description of the majestic, powerful presence of God and the awesome worship of his majesty that I absolutely love. This is a beautiful passage to meditate on often. You may want to close your eyes while I read. And listen with your ears, but also with your heart. God welcomes you into his presence. The throne room of heaven. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardidious stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. In appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning from the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. In the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed 
to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. All right, so we begin getting into this apocalypse with uh, sort of an orientation here. Not too difficult. I want to talk about four things. Heaven, God in three persons. I want to talk about the scroll, and then I want to talk about worship, and then we're going to go into communion together. First of all, um, heaven. There's a door, there's a voice, and there's an invitation to the Apostle John to come up and to experience something. To, to see it, to hear it. Daryl Johnson, in his book, Discipleship on the Edge, says there is a supreme headquarters. There is a control center of the universe. There is a seat of authority and power. And that's what I want you to remember as we talk about heaven. In the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the worlds and the universes and all the agendas, there is one throne room. There is one control center. And this is amazing for the seven churches of Asia Minor because they too are thinking of a throne. But they are thinking of the throne of Caesar. They are thinking that they are being called to worship Caesar. And now John says, no, wait, there is another control room. There is another place that you need to be aware of. Not all things are as we think or as they seem. There is another room. It speaks to our imagination. So in that apocalypse, there are 24 thrones. And and these 24 individuals are attired in white, maybe because of their holiness. They, They have crowns, maybe because of their royalty. Various interpretations. Some feel that these are a juxtaposition of the 24 pagan gods of the Roman pantheon. Maybe, maybe these are angels. But most would say, this is redeemed humanity. This is the 12 tribes of Israel. This is the 12 apostles of the New Testament. These are the 24 individuals coming together to represent every man, woman, and child saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they're there to worship. They are redeemed history. And the key response, we'll talk about it later, is worship. They fell down and they worshiped the Lamb. There's a crystal sea. So in this day, the sea was feared. The sea was a negative thing. Uh, Often there in the sea would be storms. And you know in this letter that the beast comes out of the sea. The sea represents chaos, but not here, not in heaven. It's a crystal sea. It's, It's been subdued, but it separates the throne from humankind. But by the end of this letter, this apocalypse, there is no more sea. There is no more separation between God and his creation. Then there are these four living creatures, quite colorful, coming straight out of the book of Ezekiel. Uh, The four living creatures. Our artists, our artists have just completed the the Easter series. We should give them a hand. Uh, Out there, some amazing art. And they're going to... The artists are uh, going to have an event on Thursday night to celebrate what they've done, but they're also putting up um, art for the apocalypse, which I can hardly wait to see. 
So maybe these four living creatures, the guardians of the throne, all the the living creatures seem to be um, represented here. The living creatures on land, the living creatures in the air, the living creatures on the sea, and then, and then the pinnacle of God's creation, humankind, continuously giving adoration. There was a little book uh, a long time ago called Heaven is for Real. A little boy named Colton, he was having surgery and he went to heaven. He saw his parents there. He goes for a period of time. They made a, a movie out of it. He, when he comes back from heaven, he says, oh, Jesus was the first one to greet me. And then he begins to tell his parents things that his parents had never told him. The parents had never told him that they had a little girl who died. Um, and he said to his mom and dad, I have a sister and I met her. And they had never told him that. And then he, he uh, meets other people from the family. And so the mom, interested, shows a picture of the grandfather. And he goes, no, that, no, I never met that man. Mom, that man has glasses. Nobody in heaven has glasses. Everybody is young, he says. And then months later, he sees a young picture of his grandfather. He goes, that's him. That's Papa. I met him. That's what he looks like. And there were these wonderful little illustrations. My friends, my friends, heaven is for real. It is a real place. Jesus said in John chapter 14, Jesus is not a liar. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I've gone to prepare a place, I'm gonna come back and take you to be with me. Jesus wants you there in heaven, in this wonderful place of communion and peace and forgiveness and revitalization. In this apocalypse, heaven is described for us. Powerful, majestic. We we see such a contrast between Caesar's throne and the throne room of heaven. And certainly a contrast between heaven and hell. There is a heaven. And I urge you to open your heart to the realities of that heaven. Now, let me talk about God. Uh, God in three persons. The Trinity is very, very uh, well represented in this apocalypse. Well, let me first talk about God. So God creator, God father. God in chapter four is the one first worshiped. We call this a theophany. So John is very careful not to depict the one on the throne in human terms because we know from the Old Testament that God cannot be seen or grasped, cannot fully be understood. So here there are uh, reflections of gems, precious stones, and lights. Someone is sitting on the throne that is indescribable and, and unapproachable in shades of light. Central figure of human history proceeding from God's throne. It looks like lightning and thunder. This, this clearly is an indication to Exodus 19 and Mount Sinai. So Sarah and I, this week, we, we decided that we would watch The Testament of Moses. Has anybody watched that on Netflix? So we watched these three episodes, and they do a good job in that series about Sinai. So when Moses gets there the first time, it's a burning bush, and it's not consumed. And then when he goes the second time for the Ten Commandments, there are pearls of thunder and lightning and rumbling and cloud. So what Moses experiences of his theophany on Sinai is depicted here by the Apostle John in heaven itself. It's a spectacular place. And what's being said here is that the same God, the same God that delivered the Jewish people from their Pharaoh will be the same God that delivers the seven churches of Asia Minor from their Pharaoh, from their Caesar. God is their deliverer, amen? Amen. Now here's the thing. If you face a Pharaoh, if you face an obstacle in a mountain, God is the God who will deliver you from that trial and from that darkness and from that serious circumstance over time. God is the same God. We sang it today. And this declaration of God's awesome power we'll see again in the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath. Second, the spirit is here. God, Father, creator, and then spirit. In 4-5, Monica read, 
And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, two metaphors here that you should pick up even if you're not familiar with apocalyptic literature. First, fire. Fire represents the spirit of God. God is a consuming fire. The spirit moves like fire, like fire by night, cloud by day. The spirit also is perfect. And so seven always represents perfection in the book of Revelation. It's not a real number. Don't ever think it's a real number. It's perfection. And so this is the perfect spirit of God here. And then five, six, we see the lamb standing as if slaughtered, having seven horns, meaning uh, perfect power. Seven eyes, meaning perfect ability to see all things. And are the seven spirits of God sent into the earth. So here we have the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is the last time that the sevenfold spirit or the Holy Spirit is mentioned in heaven because the spirit is not in heaven. The spirit is on earth working out the gospel and bringing about the kingdom of God. He is here on earth to fill you, to fill our church and to lead you on assignment this week. The spirit of truth, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the perfect spirit. Then we come to Jesus Christ. And John is told, don't weep, the lion. And so first a lion so th this is rooted in Old Testament prophecy. The lion is uh, strong and courageous. The lion is uh, the throne of David. And he is there to open the scroll. But, but then the most amazing moment in the chapter, I think, and maybe in this first part of the book, is that when John actually uh, turns to see the lion, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. And this is extremely important as we describe Jesus Christ. He sees a lamb like one that is slain, meek, and overcome perhaps by death, yet not overcome. This is Isaiah 53. This is the messianic prophecy, pro prophecy that he will be wounded. He will be pierced. He will be crushed for our iniquities. And here he is now, the center of the universe, the center of the throne, the lamb's seven horns speaking of perfect power, his seven eyes of unlimited wisdom and penetrating insight. I want you to know that it is not the strong that win the race, it is the humble. It is the meek. Servant leadership is the pathway to success in this life. This life is not about imitating the power of this world, but imitating the meekness and the humbleness of servant leadership as found in Jesus Christ, who is worthy to be praised. If you wanna follow an example, follow the example of Jesus Christ, who overcame the powers of this dark world by a paradox of humility and meekness, the cross broken and spilled out because of Jesus Christ's decisive victory over Satan and sin and death he and he alone is able to open the scroll let me talk for a moment about the scroll so John's weeping because no one can open the scroll no one can be found anywhere who is entitled by virtue or moral excellence to break the seals and unroll the scroll so what is this scroll there's, you're gonna see what the scroll is in the next chapter, in the next sermon, because it's gonna start breaking open the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath. But I would say that the scroll is the mystery of all things. It is the word of God, the will of God, the ways of God. That which has been sealed for centuries, this is the destiny of humankind. This is all the answers that we've ever cried for. This is the unraveling of all the mysteries that we've ever desired to be made known. It's all the whys that we have always asked. This is the unraveling of truth. And no one is strong enough or smart enough or wise enough. And the, the drama intensifies in Psalm 139, verse 16, it says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the scroll. Your life, my life, the life of all humankind rolled up and sealed with seven seals. And then 
There is this climactic moment where Jesus, the author of life and death, brings history to its final climactic end by opening the seven seals and releasing what we already know to be true, the horses of the apocalypse, which bring death and destruction, but are ultimately overcome by the Lamb of God. So I remember very distinctly sitting in a funeral home in Delta beside a little boy who's weeping over his father's death. And I'm asking, why? Why, God, why? Why? Why did this man die? Why has this child been left an orphan? Why, God? Why? Why all the unexplained tragedy? Why? For the innocent, the orphan, the rejected, the persecuted. Why, Lord? Why the pain and the death and the injustice and the wrong and the evil? And why, God, does it seem to be ignored? Why? This week, I'll join a small team from CLA as we move into Ukraine. There in Lutsk and Lviv and and Kyiv, we go, we go as a small team, as ambassadors from CLA, to encourage a church that has been under a boot of tyranny for two years. Churches blown up, pastors killed, people uh, sent away. Why, God? I pray every day, God, bring peace. God, bring peace. I don't know why. You don't know why. We don't understand all of the things of life, all of the mysteries. But one day, one day, Jesus Christ, he will break the seals and the history of mankind will be broken open. And we, for the first time, will discern why God did what he did and how he did it. It's the scroll, my friends. And so this week, I ask you to pray for us as we go into darkness and torment, into death and injustice, so that we can bring love and hope to a church that is growing exponentially. Pray for our protection and encouragement. Pray for us as we take money to them so that they can buy generators and begin to rebuild their churches. And maybe as an act of worship today, you even want to support this project. As we go into Ukraine, you can give. So who? Who is the one that unlocks the mysteries of life? In this life right now that you are walking and the one in the future, it's Christ. It's the Lamb of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one who wages a victorious war against the beast. Christ is available to you today. And whatever pressure you're facing, whatever you're going through, his spirit is here in this room to help you understand and discern the mystery and the war and to give you courage to remain as an individual who would persevere towards righteousness. The last thing I wanna talk about and is particularly appropriate as we move towards communion is worship. If chapter four and five are about anything, it's about worship. Chapter four is the worship of God. Chapter five is the worship of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter four, uh, all Aspects of creation break into worship of God. And they're worshiping God, the Father, God for his creative activity. What does the Westminster Catechism say? It says, what is the chief end of humanity? The chief end of humanity is to glorify and enjoy God forever. Why do you exist? To glorify and to enjoy God's favor forever. Simple, right? That's our calling. Three verbs are expressed here. That God would receive glory and honor and thanks. Glory because of his splendor. Honor acknowledging his worthiness. Thanks in recognition for all he has done, particularly in creation. So today, praise his holiness. When you begin to praise and worship God, something happens. The affirmation of his omnipotence. He is almighty. When the church, the seven churches began to worship God, they began to understand, even in the midst of severe testing and persecution, that that declaration of God's unlimited power would strengthen them and would encourage them and would empower them, imagine, and for you. When you're going through trial, when you're going through pressure, when you begin to worship God, a miracle takes place. Your mind is renewed. Your heart is encouraged. Your soul begins to to soar. Imagine the seven churches as they began to worship. Worthy, worthy, worthy is God. All of a sudden they see, they see not Nero's throne, but they see the throne of God and they have hope. And then in 
chapter five, we see Jesus. After chapter four, I am, I am, I was, I, I will ever be, then focus is on Jesus. Worshiping of God gives way to a new song. And for you and me, CLA, we sing a new song, a song of redemption. God worshiped because of creation, but Jesus Christ, he is worshiped because of Easter. He is worshiped because of death and resurrection. He is worshiped because of salvation. He is worshiped because he can heal and he can defend and he can raise you up and he will give you abundant life now and he will give you eternal life beyond the grave, worshiping Jesus with a new song. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, we, the new covenant people, sing a song focused on the lamb, the one who is redeemed, the one who can take the scroll. It says they sang a new song, worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seal. For you were slaughtered, you, you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. In verse 13, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under earth and on the sea, I heard every creature say this, th this will happen one day. All creation in heaven and on earth and under earth will say to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be the blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The whole expanse of humanity and creation will sing a song, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God who has brought redemption and brought life. First Corinthians 6, 20 says, for you, for you, CLA, you've been bought with a price and therefore glorify God with your body. We praise and honor and glorify God. It's not just the words we sang and certainly in the first service we realized that because there was no screens and there were no words. Worship is not about words, it's not about music style, it's not about likes or things that you feel more comfortable. Worship is about Him. Lamb of God, worthy of praise, to inspire hope and anticipation of justice. The Moravians, a great missionary movement, a couple hundred years ago, they started with one young man. One young man who heard that there was an island off the coast of Africa that was filled with slaves and there was no opportunity to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unless you, of course, were sold into slavery. And so that one man from the continent of Europe sold himself into slavery so that he could go to that island and he could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. When his family and his little church and his little community went down to the docks to say goodbye to him as he got on the boat for a life of slavery in order to proclaimed Jesus Christ, he remembered Revelation chapter five, verse 12. He shouted it from the trip, from the ship. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And that became the slogan of Moravian missions. Today, we're gonna dedicate Jenny Gallardi Place. She too was someone who believed that her life, that all of her devotion that all of her strength and all of her calling was wrapped up in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because he was worthy. He was worthy of her life. And she planted this church. And 85 years later, the gospel continues because of a woman who was faithful to a call. My friends, Jesus is worthy of your life. He holds the keys to life and death. He is the one who opens history and brings it to its conclusion. He is worthy. He's worthy of your life. So does he have your life? Does he have your hopes and your agenda? Does he have your wealth? Does he have your time? More than a worship song, he's looking for your heart. He's worthy of your life. CLA. I'd like you to stand. Today, this letter, it calls us to surrender to the Lord of Lords and the coming King, to yield our wills.
like you to bow your heads just for a moment. We're going to sing a song in prayer, prayer our hearts for communion, but um, I want you to bow your heads. Heaven is for real. It's a real place. John saw it in his vision. Christ has gone to prepare a place for you. And I have to ask you today, if you died, if you died today, do you know that Jesus would be the first face that you would see? Do you know that your inheritance is eternal, that it's heaven? If you don't, and you want to, I want to pray for you. And if that's you, with eyes closed, heads bowed, I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. I want you to know the forgiveness of Christ. I want you to know, yeah, thank you. This is just between you and God. Just raise your hand, I want to pray for you. That you would know forgiveness, that you would know Jesus in a personal way. The second question, maybe for more in this room, is that maybe you're in chaos, you're facing pressure, temptation, feeling crushed, and you need to know that God is in control. You need to know that someone's on a throne, that Christ can help you overcome in the midst of whatever you're going through, the unexpected, the betrayal, the pressure, the spiritual compromise, the injustice, that someone reigns and will give you strength and direction. And if that's you, you're in chaos and you need God, I want you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Father, I pray right now. I pray for those coming to Christ for forgiveness and grace and life, abundant life, eternal life. As we turn our lives, our will over to you, Father, I pray for those who are in chaos today. I pray those who are facing trial and turmoil. I pray for your peace. I pray for your strength. I pray that you would give them discernment. Father, I pray that you would release your spirit of justice and love and peace into their heart and in their mind and in their circumstances. You're on the throne, Jesus. You're on the throne. And so now, my friends, as we prepare for communion in the words of George Hebert all creatures of my God and King lift up your voice and sing let your life today be a song of worship to creator God to the Lamb of God let's sing on a hill in Israel mercy spoke for me mercy spoke for me Mercy spoke for me It was on Golgotha Street His death brought liberty His death brought liberty Oh, His death brought liberty And may I never boast In anything Except the cross of Jesus Christ And may I not forget The blood he shed It is by his death I am alive Because of Christ I am alive What a humble sacrifice Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean And what a blessed mystery His punishment, my peace His punishment, my peace His punishment, my peace And may I never boast in anything Except the cross of Jesus Christ And may I not forget the blood He said It is by His death I am alive And may the cross of Jesus Christ and may I not forget the blood he shed it is by his death I am alive and because of Christ 
agenda, your call, he's worthy. And today we celebrate this communion. And so if you've spent the last hour or so working on that first piece of plastic, you've successfully got it off and got the wafer. Today, this wafer reminds us of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who went to a cross, who died, who rose again. The Lamb of God who gives you life, abundant life now, and life, eternal life beyond the grave. Let's take this wafer as we remember Christ Jesus together. And before we sing, I believe. In rapturous faith and hope, we take this cup. A tangible symbol, symbol of the blood of Jesus the Old Testament Passover. What I want you to do is I want you to metaphorically put the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of your life. I want you to put the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of your family. I want you to put the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of this church. That we would know his protection and provision and anointing and blessing. And so Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And today we place the blood of Jesus over our heart, over our family, over our lives. And we celebrate your death, but also your resurrection and your coming again. Let's take the cup together. Now, as we close, I want you to sing this song. I believe. I want you to sing with faith and hope and joy and anticipation that there is an inbreaking of the Spirit of God in your life, in my life, in our coming week. 
whatever God's agenda is for you. Let's sing together. One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, his life is death to me. Let's sing this out, y'all. Come on. All praise to God our Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mind. Preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Ears have heard or eyes have seen I believe that a day is coming He's returning to claim His bride Like the altar, keep it burning See the Lamb who rolls a roaring light All praise to God Sing that we'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's sing it.